Thank you very much, uh, Mamta. Thanks uh, uh, to the organizers for this. Uh, I'll be talking about the basics of uh, uh, the toric intraocular lenses and as to how to optimize the outcomes with toric intraocular lenses. Uh, first of all, what we need to understand is that when we are looking at today's cataract surgery, it is only about 57% of the people who get a post-operative refraction with this, within half a diopter of emetropia. And the consistency of these outcomes are variable depending on the surgeon's skill and the expertise, the experience, and how the surgeon plans the surgery. But what has been observed that seven out of 10 patients are likely to benefit if there is an astigmatic correction. Some amount of with the rule astigmatism may be beneficial in some situations, but in case you get nearer to uh, minimal astigmatism, it could benefit about seven to 10 uh, of these patients. Now, what happens is that if we leave this astigmatism uncorrected, the distance vision, the reading speed, the clarity for intermediate as also clarity for driving, they all tend to decrease. So this is something which is something which causes a diminution in the quality of vision. So what one needs to do is to try and look at the astigmatism preoperatively and try to plan as to if astigmatic correction would be required through a lens-based surgery or a corneal-based surgery that is there. Now, typically, I think today, the entire world has switched over to toric intraocular lenses. When we are looking at astigmatism, which is more than a diopter or a diopter and a quarter, the incoming of the femtolaser-assisted cataract surgery is being used for taking care of astigmatism, which is of lesser degrees. But however, if you have an astigmatism, which is more than about a diopter, a, a, a diopter and a half, then you need to go on to a lens-based surgery. Now, if we look at the correction of astigmatism through an intraocular lens, there are several potential sources of error, and these could have a domino effect that could be there. Now, when you are looking at the domino effect or what are the potential sources of errors which could get compounded, the first and the foremost is the biometry. A good accurate biometry will give you a good outcome as regards the selection of the intraocular lens that has to be implanted. Then there could be errors in transcription. So therefore, now the equipments or the instruments that are being made talk to each other so that there is no need for transcription, but still a lot of us use this transcription. Now coming on to the next, there are going to be possibilities of having error as to the planning of the procedure. And there are hundreds of nomograms that are available, but there are some nomograms that have stood out and we need to plan with a proper nomogram depending upon what equipment we have used. Now, the next thing that comes is the marking. Once you are looking at marking onto the cornea, this is very important because there could be errors of cyclorotation. That means that when a patient is sitting up and when a patient is lying down, there is a rotational movement that happens and what you are wanting to place could be, or the intraocular lens could be placed at a wrong position. Now, the other thing that could be there is that you have not planned your incision well, and the surgically induced astigmatism has not been taken into account. I'll be talking about that in a little bit of detail subsequently. Now, the other important thing for a toric intraocular lens a proper positioning of the capsulorexis so that there is no movement of the intraocular lens after the patient gets up from the table and the surgery is complete. So this is something very, very important that the capsulorexis and an adequate positioning of the table remains where it is supposed to be. And Dr. Mohan Rajan will be talking about if there are rotations, etc. And this would therefore lead on to an optimization of the outcomes, which is something which is what, what we want to know. Now, when we look at the IOL implantation, I will be dividing it into pre-operative challenges, intraoperatively and post-operative part will be taken by Mohan Rajan. Now, when you are looking at the pre-operative challenges, the most important thing for you to refine the toric IOL power is to understand the anatomy of the cornea and what you want as an outcome. So first and the foremost important thing is that the pre-operative measurements need to be taken pretty well. And therefore, your biometry needs to be very, very accurate and your keratometry needs to be very, very accurate. The second thing is that you should have a very good or an excellent intraoperative procedure that uh, precision. That means that you have a precise outcome of your surgery because we should consider it as slightly a premium intraocular lens implantation. 
and third would be that if you have residual uh, astigmatism that is left the post operative whether you need to redial the uh, iol or you need to do enhancement procedures that is something which is required now let us look at the pre operative challenges the first and the foremost important thing is that when you are doing a keratometry and a biometry on to the patient that should be done on an untouched cornea if you have already played with the cornea maybe done a gonioscopy or you have done an applanation pressure etc then the outcomes are going to be very very different and nowadays there is emphasis on the tear film composition the ocular surface status and that there is no punctate epitheliopathy and the patient has not just turn uh, just 5 minutes ago taken out the contact lens so all these factors need to be taken into account and therefore it is very very important that you have a pristine clear cornea if the patient has any of these you should call the patient once again maybe treating the patient with some lubricants so that the cornea is pretty good and you get good measurements because bad measurements can change the amount of astigmatism that you want to correct now what is also very very important in the pre operative uh, procedure is that the calibration of the measurement device needs to be done so whatever you may be using i am not proposing that this is what you have to use but whatever you are being used uh, using it has to be calibrated very well and has to be used by trained ophthalmologists or technicians and you have to select as to which of the device you want to use because there are plethora of devices and you could get confused as to which device you want to use to get the best uh, best uh, uh, biometry and the best iol selection that is there now if you look at the keratometric challenges there are several ways of measuring the uh, the keratometric reading of the cornea you could have the manual k you could have the iol master which looks at the central 2.5 mm the lens star gives you two rings 2.35 and 1.65 and there are new challenges that are coming which is in post refractive surgery you need to use new nomograms etc but suffice to say that your reading should be accurate and repeatable and should be ideally looking at the center of the cornea because that is the most important thing for you to look when you are doing a toric intraocular lens now when you are looking at the astigmatism there are three important major issues which uh, for the sake of clarity i am going to uh, be discussing the first is something that over the last decade i would say posterior corneal astigmatism that has gained more and more importance than what it had earlier the second is the toricity ratio and the third is the sia so we'll discuss all three of them one by one now what exactly is posterior corneal astigmatism when you are looking at a cornea there is the anterior part of the cornea and the posterior part of the cornea in both the cases vertically it is more steeper than the horizontal but since the back part of the cornea is negative therefore the effect of a steeper posterior corneal astigmatism or a steeper posterior cornea is that it will translate the power horizontally so that means that it has a reverse effect on to the anterior corneal surface that is something very very important that you need to understand now what you again have to understand is that the posterior corneal astigmatism whatever it may be is usually stable and it does not change and for whatever reasons whether it is excessive blinking etc pressure on the cornea in anterior corneal astigmatism there is a gradual shift from with the rule to against the rule astigmatism and it is supposed to be around 3/8 of a diopter over a decade so you need to take this into account that the anterior corneal astigmatism a with the rule could become an against the rule astigmatism as a person or the cornea ages so therefore what is very very important for you to understand is that there are several people who have come out with nomogram and baylor is i think one which is slightly uh, at one end which says that if you place the astigmatism according to the nomogram threshold that means that if there is an anterior corneal astigmatism which you have measured which is with the rule then there could be a tolerance up to 1.7 because he feels that this when you take it out the posterior corneal astigmatism 0.7 diopters needs to be neutralized that means that you could tolerate an astigmatism of with the rule up to 1 because 0.7 needs to be taken out so that means you should be less aggressive in treating with the rule astigmatism but if you look at against the rule because you are going to compound that with the posterior corneal astigmatism so the tolerance has to be much less 
So if you have an against the rule of say 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, if you add 0 0.7 to that, so that astigmatism becomes more. So therefore, you have to critically analyze whether the astigmatism to start with is with the rule or against the rule that is there. And therefore, because as I said earlier, with the rule astigmatism going down over time, so younger patients, if you have to treat, you should go easy on correcting with the rule astigmatism, but you should be much more aggressive in treating against the rule astigmatism. I hope uh, these things have been made clear. So please see age of the patient, whether the patient has with the rule or against the rule, and accordingly you decide as to how you are going to treat the astigmatism and the calculators must give you these choices which uh, which should be there on the toric calculator and you should plan it accordingly now let us see how can you measure the posterior corneal astigmatism when it started the only thing was the pentacam or the galeli uh, as of now the oct and the schwemflo uh, people are trying to combine that but today the iol master 700 gives you the posterior corneal astigmatism and it gives you the TK value. That is the total keratometry value. And that is something very, very important. You can go on to a nomogram, even if you don't have a, a pentacam or you don't have a galeli, you can go on to a nomogram and plan accordingly to take the PCA or the posterior corneal astigmatism into account when you are planning uh, the toric IOL implantation. Let me just show you this example. This patient had a 1.29 astigmatism, which was there. If, uh, sorry, a 1.5, if you look here, 43 and 43.5. So when the patient was operated upon with the SIA, the residual astigmatism, if the toric lens was not put, was 1.29. When you looked at the ZCT and you, you tried to uh, put that, there was still a residual astigmatism and that was a problem. In this, what is important is that the posterior astig uh, corneal astigmatism was not taken into account. But if you go and take the posterior corneal astigmatism and instead you are looking at the 225 correction and in this particular case, the patient was very satisfied and the outcome was much better. So your choice from 150 changes to 225 if you are taking the posterior corneal astigmatism into account. So this is something very, very important that you need to, in the calculator, take care of the posterior corneal astigmatism. And that is how you should treat this particular patient. Now, the second thing that we have to talk about is called as the toricity ratio. When you're looking at the toricity ratio, this is the astigmatism of the IOL versus the astigmatism at the corneal plane. The cornea is in front, the IOL is behind, so there is a distance between the two. So an correction in the IOL is not the same as the correction in the cornea. While you are measuring the, uh, the astigmatism in the cornea and you are placing the IOL behind it, so there is a ratio and this is called as the toricity ratio. Now, something which one has to remember is that the toricity ratio is not fixed. Though a lot of the formulas have taken a fixed toricity ratio. This is akin to saying that if you don't want to consider the effective lens position of the eye, it is not going to have a difference on the outcome as regards the sphericity. So therefore, the spherical correction, there is a, there is a definite uh, link with the effective lens position. Similarly, the toricity ratio is something which is very, very important. And basis on the toricity ratio, you the IOL and the corneal plane toricity has to be taken into account. Now, if you look at the cylindrical powers, what is important is that the IOL plane, a one diopter onto the cornea translates to only 0.69 diopters. Okay. So this is the difference between the corneal astigmatism and the lens placement as to where the lens is. And if you keep on going, a six diopters on the cornea will translate uh, on the lens would translate to only 4.11 di diopter onto the cornea. So this is something which is very, very important. Now let us see how it changes if you are changing as regards the steepness of the cornea and as regards the length of the eye. Now, if you look at a hyperopic eye, the, the lens, because the eye is small, the lens will be nearer to the cornea and therefore this toricity ratio would be smaller. But if you have myopic eyes, that means that the lens and the cornea are far apart, then the toricity ratio would go higher. So this is something very, very important. And if you look at the calculation, if you have steeper corneas and if you have larger eyes, so that means that if your cornea is 48 diopters, 
and your axial length is 30 then the toricity index could go as high as 1.86 on the contrary if you have an axial length of 20 and you have a flatter cornea then the toricity index can go down to 1.29 so this is something very very important that the toricity ratio has to be understood and the formulas normally take into account this but you have to have a clarity that there is going to be a difference between a lens that is placed far behind the cornea or nearer to the cornea and whether the cornea is deeper or flatter. Now let us come to the third part which is the SIA or the surgically induced astigmatism. Earlier it was just thought that it is the incisions uh, uh, which is there which is very important and nasal incisions gave more uh, astigmatic uh, uh, non-neutral incisions as compared to superior and the temporal gave the most astigmatically neutral incision. But the vector analysis that was being done was only being done to measure the size of the incision while the multiple directions on which the incision was going to be placed was not taken into account. That means you said that this is the incision and only one axis was particularly taken. It was not fed into the vector analysis and therefore there was no centroid value that was given. So this is something very, very important that you have to calculate your own SIA by filling in the case, uh, case sheets, which will indicate the size of the incision, the location of the incision and the type of the incision. And this is what you have to fill in and get your own SIA. Now, what is very, very important is that the preoperative astigmatism has to be double angle plots. That means that the direction in which or the axis in which the incision has been put needs to also be taken into account and therefore you will get what is known as a centroid and this centroid value or the centroid plot is something very very important that the vector analysis has to take into account the incision size the type of the incision and the location of the incision and then you will get your own SIA that is something very very important. So the Barrett Toric calculator in incorporates uh, this is one that most of us use the posterior corneal astigmatism, the ACD and the axial length, the toricity ratio as also the centroid for the SIA. So this is something very, very important. So I have discussed about that. Now let us just come to the uh, last part of my talk. That means that you have to mark the cornea very well. It is not necessary for you to be on a markerless system, though markerless systems are thought to be better but you can actually dry the cornea, put a needle mark and then make a small mark. You can do it freehand, you can do it with the bubble marker or you can use your slit lamp. So these are all different ways, but you need a steady hand and the patient sitting upright and you need to mark that patient. You can also use the eye trace, uh, Zaldivar uh, projection will come. You can see here that the marking was done here and here. And this is actually two to three degrees away from what the Zaldivar or the eye trace says. So therefore, if you have a eye trace, then you can actually decide as to what should be the placement intraoperatively, uh, keeping into view that this was the correction that was there. Now, the rotational stability is something very, very important. If there is a malrotation by about 1%, it causes a 3.3% correction loss. Malrotation by 30% will lead to a total loss of correction and malrotation above 30 degrees will increase the astigmatism. Therefore, the marking and the placement of the toric IOL is something which is very, very important. Now, what are the challenges for rotational stability? There will be increased rotation if it is a larger eye, if there are zonular weakness in high myopia or the capsular bag mismatch with the IOL is there and this reduces the uh, equatorial friction which is slightly less. Now some people advocate not to polish the back of the anterior capsule because some amount of anterior capsular opacification helps in keeping the IOL in place but in case you have a large CCC you have an asymmetric capsular uh, coverage or you get a phimosis or a lot of capsular fib uh, fibrosis or if you have tears in your capsular excess, these are things which are going to adversely affect the final positioning of the intraocular lens in the post-operative period. Now, finally, when you are putting the lens, there are various tools which are markerless. You could use a Varion system, you could use a Callisto eye, you could use an Aura, or you could use the eye trace, which you have done preoperatively. <coughs> this is how the Varion works. The Varion can give you the limbus, it can give you the pupil, it can give you the marking, etc. 
and you can guide as to this should be the final position in the variant that you want that this should be the variant uh, marking and this should be how the lens needs to be placed uh, at the end now this is a callisto system where a femto laser has been done you can see that there is a mark but the mark is not corresponding to the callisto so there is a difference here and once you have taken about the lens uh, fill it uh, well do not overflate and then over inflate and then you can see that these three lines uh, ideally the toric marker should come into the center of these three lines that you are putting in the lens which is a a uh, multifocal trifocal lens with a toric and you can see that you have to put it in the same place and go ahead so these are marker systems which help you uh, i would not be talking about uh, a detail but the ora ora is a wavefront aerometry which can help you place the lens after uh, the surgery has been done it will tell you what lens to pick up and put it into the eye so to sum up what i will wish to say is that if you have to maximize the outcomes you need to do accurate biometry accurate keratometry you should have uh, the nomograms which you are aware of which you have to work the incision should be a perfect incision basing up based upon your sia uh, maybe a slightly smaller nexus which overlaps the entire lens of 5 or a 5.2 5.5 for nexus is good you should never over inflate the bag at the end of the procedure you should ensure complete visco removal from the bottom of the uh, iol nudge the iol on to the back surface of the pc uh, on to the uh, on to the front of the pc so that the iol pc gets in touch ensure the position of the iol is good after removing the speculum sometimes the speculum can cause some rotation and that is what you have to see and in case there is residual uh, uh, astigmatism subsequently if you can do an eye trace or look at it maybe you can uh, correct it within the first couple of weeks and you can go on to astigmatismfix.com to see as to how you should best correct so this is what i wanted to say as an introduction to the toric intraocular lenses and to make the concepts clear as regards the toric iol thank you very much for your kind attention so thank you uh, 